You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 16, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Contact Dermatitis, Part 1. Our presenter is Dr. Elise Harrow. She's a Contact Dermatitis Fellow at Rady Children's Hospital at the University of California, San Diego in San Diego, California. Welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 16, 2011. We have two presentations today. Um, coming up in just a few minutes, uh, Dr. Elise Harrow is going to talk with us about contact dermatitis. Uh, a little bit later at 11 o'clock, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Prescott Atkinson, who's going to review atypical infections and asthma. Well. A number of a couple of months ago, I was in uh, Huntington Beach, California, at a at a conference attending uh, the well, I guess it was the uh, South the California Allergy Society meeting, and uh, I had the opportunity of listening to a presentation about contact dermatitis. Uh, in speaking to the presenter, I found out that uh, that she and uh, Dr. Harrell worked together, and that uh, they they spent a lot of time studying and working on contact dermatitis. It was an absolutely fascinating lecture. It's a topic that most allergists are fairly deficient in. We know to put the true test on, and if it's positive, we tell them that that's what it was. But clearly, that's not sufficient. We need to know more about contact dermatitis. And so to enhance our knowledge of this field, uh, Dr. Hero has graciously agreed to speak with us today. And this is part one of a two-part series on contact dermatitis. Um, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Hero. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to have this opportunity. Today we'll be talking about allergic contact dermatitis and specifically the differential diagnosis. Okay, you so, should have control of the mouse now. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure if... Just look there and it'll advance. What's that? Just click on the little scroll bar and it'll advance, or you can use your keyboard and just click right there. There you go. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so for this presentation, there will be many images, but they, they really are to be used solely for educational purposes. And to start off in discussing contact dermatitis, there really are three main types that we talk about. The first one and the most common being irritant contact dermatitis. The second, which is more of our specialty, is allergic contact dermatitis, making up 20%. And finally, contact urticaria, which is the least common. And I'll speak about each one separately. So in discussing the characteristics of allergic versus irritant, as I said, that Allergic is less common, making up 20%, irritant being the most common. One of the lar biggest differences is that allergic is a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. It's T cell mediated, specifically Th1, T helper cells. Whereas irritant is non-immunologic, therefore it does not require an antigen. The allergic reactions do require lipophilic, low molecular weight haptins that bind with proteins once they penetrate the skin because of their low molecular weight. And it does require prior sensitization before actually eliciting the clinical allergic response that we see. And as you had mentioned with the true test, patch testing is the gold standard for diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis, whereas with irritant contact dermatitis, a good history, thorough physical and clinical picture can sometimes rule in this diagnosis. So moving on to the clinical features that we were discussing, with allergic, one of the reasons why we're covering a differential diagnosis is because it is so broad, given the many different ways that it can present. You can have a macular erythema, induration, papules, vesicles, bullae, and or excoriations. 
Whereas with irritant, you're generally going to have a scaly, erythematous background, plus or minus papules and scoriations, and sometimes you'll see more of a follicular appearance. And one thing that can really help you is that with irritant, you're most often going to be limited to the site that was exposed. And we'll show you some pictures of that. Whereas with allergic, again, there's really various distributions. It can occur locally, like irritant, or it can spread beyond the area of exposure, appear in an ectopic area, um, or it could generalize. So your patients may often tell you with allergic that their dermatitis tends to itch, whereas with irritant, they will describe a burning. And one of the most important clinical features is the latency of reaction. So here, allergic, because it's a delayed type 4 reaction, takes about 72 to 120 hours to appear clinically. And it could take weeks. Whereas irritants usually going to come on within 48, and frequently it should resolve by 96. Whereas allergic won't really resolve for a couple weeks, maybe even more. So in patch testing, this is an important point that there's the initial read at about 48 hours, and then we always do a delayed read as well. Because initially, you may have just an irritant reaction and not really be able to tell the difference. But if you do a delayed read at 96 hours or 120 hours, if your reaction is still there, it's more likely that it's allergic in nature and not irritant. So, for example, this is one of our adolescent patients with a allergic contact dermatitis. This particular distribution I wanted to show because as it's on the hairline and really affecting the scalp and the back of the neck, this distribution often follows shampoo or soaps, uh, specifically due to surfactant called cocamidylpropylbetting. In this individual, there is some impetigenization here with some yellow crusting that I hope you can appreciate. Well, why would it happen just in that one spot? It's, it's actually not just in the one, let me reverse, um, not just in this one spot. She has it lower on the rest of her neck, and she also has it on the other side of her, of her scalp. Behind her ears is often uh, an area that you'll see it too because of the soap coming down there as well. Um, this is, I actually had several pictures from this girl, um, but that is a good point. It wouldn't just be in this one spot. It may be worse here if she happens to scratch it and then allow for, for an infection, a super infection over it, though. This picture is a classic distribution for fragrance allergy. Oftentimes women do spray their perfumes in this region, um, but you'll often see fragrance as well on the face and the eyelids uh, in particular. One difference between allergic contact derm and atopic derm uh, on the eyelids is that you often see the dermatitis in the crease of the eyelids with allergic contact derm because if the fragrance uh, chemicals or the molecule gets on the eyelid, not only is that skin thinner, but when you're opening your eye, you're also causing occlusion of that area. And of course, we can't see that in this photo. What the good thing about this photo, though, is you'll do, you do see a sparing underneath her chin, which would also suggest a photoallergen. And fragrance can also be a photoallergen where it's worsened in the sunlight. The next photo is of a child that we had come in with a shoe-related dermatitis. Obviously, this is a chronic dermatitis with scarring, hyperpigmentation. And shoe dermatitis uh, can often be due to rubber accelerators, especially in children that are wearing athletic shoes. Rubber accelerators would be mercaptobenzothiazole, mercaptomix, thioram. So these are things to keep in, in mind when seeing this type of a dermatitis. This is also a foot dermatitis, but this one is more due to ankle 
braces, ankle guards during soccer. You can also see this on the shins. And you think of rubber type allergens as well. This particular girl was allergic to mixed diaglophyreas, which are a neoprene allergen. Uh, she also could have had an allergy to paratertiary butyl phenyl formaldehyde resin, which is also a neoprene allergen, as well as an adhesive. So these are seen often in shin guards uh, and athletic equipment. If she wore socks between the shin guard and her skin, would that protect it, or does it get transported by sweat through the socks? It actually can get transported by by the sweat, and we recommend that people that do have allergies to their to components of their athletic shoes or their shin guards change their socks frequently, um, because if they if they are playing sports, the sweat the sweat will eventually uh, help transport the allergen through the sock, and um, even coating or covering their, their shin guard with another fabric and, and putting that on because it, it will go through the socks if, if um, used long enough with heat as well. So this is uh, actually a child, even though the skin is very lichenified, that also has allergic contact dermatitis, she tested positive for coconutal propylbetine, which again is the surfactant that's in many soaps, hand soaps, and shampoos. And she also tested positive for bronopol, which is a formaldehyde releasing preservative. One thing that I'd like to mention though about hand dermatitis is that thyram, which is a rubber accelerator, is often implicated because of the use of gloves. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, latex versus rubber accelerators later. So this is another photograph of allergic contact dermatitis. To show the different distribution, this is actually a very localized presentation. So with a child like this or anyone that has something localized, you really want to think about what they're coming into contact with on a frequent basis. Are they holding a toothbrush with these fingers that is made of rubber, uh, a controller with rubber or plastic? Uh, are they biking and holding on to rubber handles? Uh, are they playing an instrument? Uh, oftentimes instruments have nickel in them or, or even rubber components as well. This is a, an example of diaper dermatitis, which really has a broad differential, but this particular child had allergic contact dermatitis causing it. One thing that I want to mention is that allergic contact dermatitis caused from the diaper can either be from the constituent of the diaper itself or from the topical personal care products that parents are using, uh, including different medicaments that they might use. The diaper itself not only has dispersed dyes that are used on a synthetic fabric that can leach out with sweat, but they also contain rubber accelerators in the elastic. So mercaptobenzothiazole, again, can be an allergen with the diapers as well. And then when I mentioned paratertiary butyl phenyl formaldehyde resin, I said it was a neoprene allergen. However, it's also an adhesive. So it can also cause allergy and diaper dermatitis because of the adhesives. Fragrances are often used in diapers as well, and children can be very sensitive to those, as well as different preservatives or emulsifiers that are used in the medic medicaments. Dr. Hero? Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, there was, I, I thought there was some concern also about some of the super absorbent diapers, the material they use to make the diapers super absorbent and, and have that like gel kind of consistency, it's, that, that was also could be an issue. You know, I, I have read a little bit about that, but it, it actually, it, most that I've read though about that gel is that it's more of a positive thing because of the, the frequent irritant contact dermatitis that's caused, that causes diaper dermatitis 
due to the the occlusion with urine and the feces and that if you most of the articles that I read discuss that gel being a positive thing because it helps to keep the irritants off of the skin and it actually has decreased the incidence of diaper dermatitis. However, there are going to be a small amount of people that could be sensitive to that as well. But generally, I think that that particular substance is, is thought of as more of a positive because it's decreased so many uh, diaper, the incidence of diaper dermatitis so much. So. This is a classic presentation of nickel dermatitis. The, this is periumbilical. The umbilicus is actually up here in the photo, but uh, somewhat popular in nature. This would be from a gene snap. Um, but again, nickel is found in so many different things. We mentioned instruments or um, bobby pins, coins, keys. This is a patient with a chronic dermatitis. He has not only thickening of his skin, but uh, hyperpigmentation. This is one of Dr. Jago's patients that was very allergic to a chromium component of the cement that he handled daily. This is an interesting topic that's becoming uh, more popular because of the increased sensitization that children are having to black henna tattoos. Black henna is basically, when you take natural henna and mix it with paraphenylene diamine, which is a very popular permanent hair dye. And the reason that it's used is to increase the intensity of the tattoo and the longevity of it. However, there's no regulation for the concentrations that are used with a temporary tattoo artist. And there are regulations with concentrations that are used with hair dye. So especially because these children's body surface area is so much smaller, maybe if you put this on an adult, it wouldn't have the same effect. But many children are not only developing clinical allergy to black henna tattoos, but they're becoming sensitized to PPD or paraphenylene diamine at a young age because of it. Uh, lastly, we have the classic, or almost last, I have another one actually, a classic presentation of allergic contact dermatitis, which is poison ivy or toxicodendron radicans. And here I just wanted to point out the linear nature of the dermatitis due to the, the plant itself and coming, and coming up near the plant. And then this photo is an example of erythrodermic allergic contact dermatitis. So this individual actually had full body uh, erythroderma due to allergic contact dermatitis. Oftentimes this can be caused from systemic exposure so it is possible to have a reaction due to oral intake um, of a chemical. Things that, allergens that can do this would be fragrances or formaldehyde, and that includes formaldehyde releasing preservatives, which is a rather large category. So um, again, this can cause more of a full body erythroderma, which we'll see some other conditions that would be in the differential. Theater. So just briefly to mention the histology of allergic contact dermatitis, this slide actually talks about in 24 to 48 hours what you would see under the microscope, which isn't the most clinically relevant because you're not often getting patients in this time frame to do a biopsy. However, this is experimentally derived data. So you would see lymphocytes both in, both in the epidermis and perivascularly in the dermis. And one thing that's, that you pretty much always see with uh, allergic contact dermatitis, or at least very commonly, is spongiosis or edema between the cells. And occasionally these focal areas of spongiosis will coalesce, forming vesicles. Eosinophils can also be seen in allergic contact dermatitis, which given the picture of spongiosis and lymphocytes can often suggest the diagnosis.
And what's more clinically relevant then is at greater than 48 hours, you have either a subacute or a chronic presentation, you would still see the inflammatory infiltrate that's primarily lymphocytes. However, it would be less prominent and you may not really see it in the epidermis anymore, just paravascularly in the dermis. And you should still see some mild spongiosis and then the, where they coalesce and form microvesicles. This is and could be difficult to distinguish from a numular eczema or a lichen simplex chronicus, which we'll talk about later as well. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a review of the layers of the epidermis. The left is more of a, a cartoon diagram and the right more realistic. You have the top layer, which is the stratum corneum, followed by the stratum lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and final, finally the basal layer, and then the dermis underneath. So if we look at an actual biopsy of allergic contact dermatitis, and this, the one to the right here is a, a little bit closer, so we'll go off that one. We have the microvesicles, which are the areas of edema or, or focal spongiosis that have coalesced within the epidermis. And then just these areas between the cells here, you see edema throughout the, the epidermis. There are some eosinophils, the deeper red cells within the dermis, and then finally the lymphocytes. That really now you're not seeing the lymphocytes um, to the same extent in the, in the epidermis that you would if it were earlier. So moving on to the most common type of contact derm is irritant contact. As you can see here, this is a great example of the, the site of exposure being the only site that's affected. So it's very localized. This is classic lip-licking dermatitis that you often see with children. You can also see that it's, there's erythema, there's scaling, but there's really not the papules or the vesicles uh, that you might see with allergic contact. This is an example, again, of a very localized irritant contact dermatitis from a bleaching agent that this man used. And again, this is an irritant contact from a cleaning agent, very localized. It almost looks like it's been, uh, there's been a spray of some sort that's, that's fallen on the skin, causing, causing this distribution. So this is a picture of hand dermatitis caused from irritant contact derm as opposed to the hand dermatitis that we saw from allergic contact derm. This is often described as looking like frequent hand washing. So you, it looks like generally uh, the skin has a little bit more xerosis. There's some lichenification, but of course there will be focal areas that are, are maybe excoriated or just a little bit worse depending upon the person's uh, habits. And this is another photograph of irritant contact dermatitis from soap. And you see a lot of, uh, of skin thickening and, and lichenification, even some hyperpigmentation here. So this is a photo of diaper dermatitis caused from irritant contact derm as opposed to the photo we saw before of a from allergic. Again, this is, this is a posterior view or a dorsal view, not anterior. One thing that you can see that will be really a key to the diagnosis of allergic contact derm in the diaper region is that it routinely will spare the intertriginous regions. So that's what I was saying. If this were more of an anterior view, we would see that the inguinal region would be spared oftentimes because the baby's body folds uh, the, the urine and irritants that they're exposed to would not get into the, the fold. So you would look for that sparing. And next we'll mention contact urticaria, which is the third type of contact dermatitis that we mentioned earlier. It's the least common. However, it's an immediate type 1 contact hypersensitivity as opposed to the delayed type 4 that we saw with allergic contact. So this is going to be your classic urticarial wheel and flare reaction following contact with, with certain allergens. There are two types. 
you have the allergic or the immunologic contact urticaria, ICU, and then you have the non-allergic or non-immunologic contact urticaria or NICU. So because this is a type 1 reaction, it's going to be antibody mediated, specifically IgE mediated when we talk about the immunologic type of reaction. So these individuals will have been previously exposed and sensitized, and they'll have preformed antibodies circulating, which is why you have this immediate type of reaction, because the antibodies are already been formed. This causes a release of vasoactive amines, such as histamine, and then you end up with either a localized or generalized appearance to the urticaria. Clinically, we see this more as an early positive patch test. So when we're placing our patches, each patch containing a small amount of allergen, if a child or a patient or an older patient says that they have a focal area that is very pruritic, we will take that one patch down, and if it looks like they've already formed a wheel, we'll have to take that off because it tells us that they're having an urticarial reaction and not a delayed reaction, so we can't keep it on for the usual 48 hours. One way that you can test this in a non-clinical setting is with, is with passive transfer. So this would be if you injected 0.1 milliliters of a patient serum into a human volunteer, and 24 hours later, you put 0.1 milliliters of the eliciting agent topically over that injection site. And then you would also do it on the contralateral side over a saline control site. And if you ended up with a wheel at the donor injection site, that would be considered a positive, uh, a positive reaction for contact urticaria. And as I said that, I would mention latex a little bit later. I showed a picture of a photo with allergic contact dermatitis and said that I wanted to mention Thyram as a rubber accelerator. Mercaptobenzothiazole would be another example, mercaptomix of rubber accelerators, which are different than latex that are, in, is, that are in gloves. The latex is actually the protein allergen, and when someone has an allergy to latex, it's, uh, it's a contact urticarial or a, or a type 1 reaction, whereas if they're having a glove allergy to a rubber accelerator, that's a type 4 for and oftentimes our patients come in and, and don't really understand the difference, or they think they have a latex allergy, but it's really a delayed type reaction to one of the accelerators. So people that do have allergy to latex, true latex allergy, often will cross-react with banana, peach, or kiwi. But this type of contact urticaria, the immunologic type, can also be seen with various foods. And these are just some examples of many foods that can cause this type of contact urticaria. Next, we have the non-immunologic type. And this is actually the most common type of contact urticaria. Because it's not based on, uh, on it's non-immunologic, you have non-antibody mediated release of vasoactive substances. So this is a direct influence on the vessel itself, releasing histamine, substance A, bradykinin. And there's also been, uh, uh, it's been suggested that there's a role for prostaglandin in the non-allergic uh, contact urticaria due to the fact that NSAIDs can help this condition. So the open test is what you would use here. It's a lot easier than a passive transfer test. You just have to make sure that the patient has been off of antihistamines and NSAIDs for, for 48 hours. And you would apply the substance in question to the forearm and wait 30 to 45 minutes and see if you ended up with a real reaction. So this is an example of contact urticaria, the classic real response, and obviously this is to latex, and here you see the, the latex gloves. The next condition is actually then coming out of the realm of the contact dermatitis and into the differential. And I put atopic dermatitis first because 
it's so often confused and there's so much question between the two, especially allergic contact derm and atopic derm. So one of the, the criteria most often used is the Hannafin and Roshka criteria that they published in 1980, listing both major and minor criteria. For major criteria, they list paritis, the morphology and the distribution, which classically, the, in older children and adults, you see the flexural lichenification for linearity. And then a chronic and rela or relapsing nature, and then oftentimes you get a personal or family history. And minor criteria, I've just listed some here, there's actually several. But this it would be a type 1 type of reaction where you can see increased uh, IgE. Oftentimes, especially in children, you'll see orbital hyperpigmentation and um, these Denny Morgan folds, which is that infraorbital fold right beneath the eye. Palmer hyperlinearity. Early age of onset is, is interesting. You don't have to have this, but again, it's just a minor criteria. So they're saying that patients should have three major and three minor to be considered uh, atopic. They're having atopic dermatitis. So this photograph does show the classic flexural uh, distribution for atopic dermatitis. And oftentimes we talk about an atopic triad. So about 50% of the patients with atopic dermatitis will develop asthma. Greater than 60% will develop allergic rhinitis. But what's important is that they all may not be present at the time of diagnosis, and many people may not develop the other conditions within the triad and still be considered having atopic dermatitis. So what I wanted to touch on briefly, I'm not sure what's going happened. backwards. It's good. You need to go to the bottom part of the bar underneath it, and it'll go down. Yeah. Click, click, click below the little slider, and it'll go down. Here? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, is a topic that's really important is allergic contact derm in the setting of atopic dermatitis. And this was actually many patients that Dr. Jacob and I saw that um, were referred to us because they had recalcitrant dermatitis by standard therapies, meaning um, they only were able to clear with super potent topical steroids or oral steroids or other systemic medications. And the question of whether or not there was something else going on in addition to the atopic dermatitis would come up. So that's one, one thing to think of when you're considering uh, allergic contact derm in that setting. The other thing would be is if their atopic dermatitis is progressing or deteriorating and they have an increased total body surface area, you'd want to consider allergic contact. Or if you're seeing involvement of specific body sites, the face, the eyelids, neck, hands, and we kind of went through some of those examples with our photos. The next condition that I want to talk about on the differential, because it, it does relate quite a bit to contact dermatitis, is dyshydrotic eczema. So classically, this is a vesicular pomoplantar dermatitis that patients often describe as very pruritic and burning. While it has an unknown etiology, patients with dyshydrotic eczema, um, of, of those patients, about 50% have atopic dermatitis. And, and again, the reason why I said some people even think this is a type of, of contact dermatitis is because um, a, one exogenous factor that can stimulate it or, or trigger an episode is actually contact dermatitis to nickel or cobalt, those metals, or balsam of Peru, which is related to, to fragrance, fam fragrance family of allergens. Uh, drug reactions can often trigger these episodes as well, or I shouldn't say often, but it, it is possible. It's more likely that you would get it from IVIG than heart therapy. Dermatophyte or bacterial infections can often trigger this condition as well. One thing that I wanted to mention, too, is hyperhidrosis being an aggravated factor in about 40% of people that have dyshydrotic eczema. 
But what's interesting is, even though the palmar plantar skin is very rich in the equine sweat glands, it's been shown in, on biopsy that the acrosyringium of the sweat gland is not altered with the disease. So it's really not um, based on a problem with the sweat gland. It's not related to the sweat gland. And lastly, emotional stress and environmental factors can exacerbate the dyshydrosis, such as humidity, hot and cold temperatures. So another condition that I said on histology can sometimes be confused with allergic contact dermatitis is lichen simplex chronicus. So this is actually a very common condition that's associated with chronic scratching. And it really leads to this like kenified, often hyperpigmented, excoriated, scaly plaques. And really this can be related to any condition that, that is pruritic and would cause someone to, to scratch a lot or at least get into that habit, such as atopic dermatitis or psoriasis. This is also a condition that you often see with people with nervous habits or anxiety or other psychological disorders where they have repetitive movements, where it almost just becomes, for in this instance, this was caused from the heel of the right foot on the dorsum of the left foot because that nervous habit of just rubbing uh, his or her foot on the other on the dorsum of the other foot. You also might see this in children who do initially get something like an insect insect bite that they don't leave alone and they just keep scratching and eventually you end up with this condition. So I wanted to mention pitted keratolysis because of the prevalence of shoe dermatitis among patients with contact dermatitis, having been estimated at 3.3 to 11.7 percent. So this condition, though, is pretty distinct in that you see these, these pits on the plantar surface of the feet, really in the pressure-bearing areas. You can also see it on the hands, but it's not as common. And patients will often have excessive foot odor, and they'll describe it as being painful. This is caused from cutaneous bacterial infections within the stratum corneum layer of the epidermis. And two bacteria that are often associated are Micrococcus sedentarius, which has now been renamed Chytococcus sedentarius, and Dermatophilus congolensis. So, this, too, often like the dyshydrotic eczema, can be aggravated by hyperhidrosis or, or prolonged occlusion as well. And what happens then is it, it creates an environment that the bacteria can proliferate, and they produce proteases that destroy the stratum corneum and then cause these pits that you see here a little bit closer up. So the next condition that I wanted to mention was scabies. So this is a very pruritic dermal infection. It's caused by mites, Sarcoptes scabii. It's often nicknamed the seven-year itch. Um, and this really may be subtle. It's not going to really appear as plaques. It'll be more in the crevices of the body. And it's dependent on the human host. So, so it's very contagious. And uh, one way that you can diagnose it is by taking a, a scalpel scraping of the skin or using packing tape. And what you'd be looking for is the mite itself, part of the mite, or the feces of the mite. So while potassium hydroxide can be used in the preparation to give a clear picture of the mite, it will dissolve the feces, which is sometimes the only positive finding that you have. So some people prefer using saline or mineral oil with the skin scrapings. So what happens then is that the mite gets into the skin, lays its eggs, they hatch and grow into adult mites, and you have this cycle where each mite can survive up to a month living on the human. So again, saying the seven-year itch, not only is it pruritic, but it can last a long time. So these are some examples. This would be what the mite would look like itself if you were able to actually isolate the whole, the whole mite and not just part of it. Um, but what can be really do with pathognomonic are these burrows, where literally the mite has burrowed underneath the skin. 
And here you see not only a mite here, but then the burrow behind it. This photo is good because this is the, this is the anterior aspect of the wrist facing posteriorly or, or facing inferiorly. And like I said, it's very subtle. Um, and it can really, you really want to look at the crevices, the wrist itself, look in between the fingers. So a subtype of scabies is Norwegian scabies or crested scabies. The reason why I wanted to mention this, while it's not as common, it does cause extensive hyperkeratosis in crusting with possible erythema. And as I said, you do see erythroderma. You do see erythroderma with allergic contact dermatitis as well as uh, psoriasis, even seborrheic dermatitis, which we'll mention a little bit later. So this should be on the differential. Um, what's interesting, though, is unlike classical scabies, paritis is usually absent from this. And it's a rare condition because really the risk is those that are immunocompromised or malnourished. So the next category in differential is rather large. It's fungal infections and mycoses. And actually 20 to 25 percent of the world population has skin mycoses. So the first type is caused by dermatophytes or skin, literally skin plant in Greek. Three main types of dermatophytes are trichophyton, microsporin, and epidermophyton. So with the dermatophyte infections, they're really classified based on location on the body. So tinea capitis would be the scalp, barbae would be the beard region, tinea corporis is ringworm on the body, tinea curis or jock itch in the inguinal region in the genitals, tinea pedis or athlete's foot, and tinea manum being the feet and the hands. And oftentimes with this condition you see a one hand, two feet distribution. These, can, these infections with dermatophytes are rarely systemic, so you'll usually see them more localized. And you can also do a potassium hydroxide preparation here, seeing, looking for septated hyphae. So this is an example of a patient that we had with extreme tinea capitis, and, and the scaling is so thick that it really appears as a, a, a thick white scale. It's really all over his, his scalp, and he even had to need barbae in his beard as well. So this is an example of tinea corporis on the body itself. This particular patient appearing a little bit more erythematous, maybe you can also get a, a little bit of brown pigmentation. This is an example of tinea curris in the, in the inguinal region. And then this is a patient of ours with tinea uh, pedis, which you see not only on the bottom of the feet, the lateral surfaces, but if we were to look in between the web spaces here, you oftentimes see maceration with, with dermatophyte infections of the feet. And they can oftentimes be accompanied by the onychomycosis or the, or the toenail fungus as well. So moving on to uh, more, or continuing with our fungal infections topic, Malassezia furfur is often an endogenous thing. So this is responsible for both tinea versicolor and seborrheic dermatitis. Tinea versicolor, much like tinea corporis, is found on, on the, often on the trunk and the, and the upper trunk. And I think of it as, since it's versicolor, really you can get hypopigmented patches, hyperpigmented. You see it can be brownish in pigment um, or, or a little bit more erythematous. Typically they'll have a fine scale over them. And on KOH prep, you'll see what's classically referred to as a spaghetti and meatball appearance. And you'll have hyphae and spores. Um, so the next condition being seborrheic dermatitis, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. But first, just to look at a picture of tinea versicolor, this would be an example of hypopigmented patches. Here they're more um, discrete. And then into the left here, you can see where these discrete patches can really coalesce into a larger patch. 
then if you were to take a, uh, a woods lamp to this, you would see a pale yellow-green fluorescence. So now talking about seborrheic dermatitis, the other condition that is caused by Malassezia furfur, which interestingly is normal levels of Malassezia, but an abnormal immune response to them. Uh, this is a papular squamous disorder. And the thing to think about with seborrheic dermatitis is that it really affects the sebum-rich areas of the body, specifically the scalp and the face and the trunk. When I say the face, it's the glabellar region that you can see here, and then the nasolabial folds where often you accumulate oil. And then the middle of the chest here is very common as well. So the severity really varies. A mild dandruff can be seen all the way to exfoliative erythroderma, which again, like I had mentioned before, um, you can get with allergic contact dermatitis. So like I said, this is an abnormal immune response. So people with immunodeficiency, um, such as those with HIV, um, oftentimes will, will have this, and it could be uh, pretty severe. So this is an example of the classic nasal labial fold affected by seborrheic dermatitis, and it's even into his, into his mustache region. So continuing with fungal infections, we finally get to candida, most often candida albicans, which is an opportunistic pathogen or a yeast. It's often endogenous as well. And it's been classified or talked about as a disease of the very old, the very young, and the very sick. And again, that's due to the fact that it's opportunistic. So you oftentimes see this in diaper dermatitis as well. So we talked, we looked at diaper dermatitis as having a differential of allergic contact derm, irritant contact derm, and now a candidal infection as well. Uh, candida can also be responsible for inner trigo, so inflammation of the body folds. And, and candida is not the only thing that can cause inner trigo. You can get it with bacterial or viral infections as well. Unlike dermatophyte infections, candida is more likely to manifest systemically. And so that, that is a possibility. And on KOH preparation, you'll see pseudohyphae and budding spores, which is the classic appearance. So this is a photo of candidal inner trigo. This is actually beneath the breast. And uh, again, it's, it's in the skin folds because that's really a warm, moist environment. So oftentimes, obesity would be a risk factor for this. And, and like we said, with diaper dermatitis in children with, the, with body folds as well. So the next condition that contrasts seborrheic dermatitis a little in the distribution on the face is rosacea. It's chronic, though typically benign. It can affect the eyes with ocular rosacea. And a patient should really see an ophthalmologist if that's the case. But typically, you'll get this facial erythema across the central face. And it'll be on the cheeks and across the bridge of the nose and sometimes on the forehead. Whereas with seborrheic dermatitis, you see it more in the nasolabial folds here in the glabellar region. So typically, you'll see telangiectasias. Patients can often have capitals or pustules as well. And they'll describe more of a burning and stinging than an itching. In more advanced cases, you see a rhinophyma, or the classic globulated Santa Claus nose of rosacea. And this is actually more common in women, peaking about age 30 to 60. Some patients will, will tell you that they do have triggers, such as spicy food and sunlight as well. I like this picture, um, uh, or really a portrait by Domenico Grilandau. Um, this was circa 1480 to 1490, and even in, at this time, he does a great job of illustrating the lobulated nose of rhinophyma and what I'm assuming is rosacea on the forehead here as well. So it's really been a condition that's been around for a long time. Next is Poikloderma savat, and you may have seen this on, on patients. It's really benign. Um, it may itch a little bit, 
but it's a erythema associated with a model pigmentation on the lateral aspects of the neck. And the poikloderma is referring to uh, a combination of atrophy, telangiectasias, and the pigmentary change that you see here with both hyper and areas of hypopigmentation. Now, this is actually, despite the photo, more common in women as well, just like rosacea. The next condition that's um, very common is psoriasis. So this is a chronic inflammatory disease, and it actually affects 1 to 3 percent of the general population. And among those patients, 5 to 40 percent are affected by psoriatic arthritis. And of those with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, about 40 percent have a family history of those disorders in their first degree relatives. So there is several types of psoriasis. Flax psoriasis is the most common, where you have these well-defined salmon pink flax with an overlying silvery white scale. And patients will describe either pruritus or burning. And the classic distribution are the knees and the elbows, but definitely can affect other areas as well, the trunk or the scalp. So as you can see in this photo, I wanted to show nail psoriasis, and here's some pits within the nail. That's classic for nail psoriasis. That affects up to 55% of psoriasis patients and can occur in any of the subtypes. But up to 90% of patients with psoriatic arthritis will have involvement of the nail. So if you do see that, it's, it's probably good for them to at least uh, to look into arthritis as a diagnosis. So continuous psoriasis, as we said, plaque type is the most common, but you can also get gut tape or small, quote unquote, droplet lesions that will last least weeks to months, and it will spare the palms and the soles. The other type you can get is erythrodermic, and this theme comes back. When you do see erythroderma, you think psoriasis, you think allergic contact germ, and so forth. Uh, erythroderma would be where greater than 75 percent of the body surface area is affected. And these patients can have exfoliation or desquamation. Um, pustular psoriasis is another type um, where you do have individual coalescing pustules. And this can be generalized or localized to the palms and the soles, which is in contrast to gut tape psoriasis that will not affect the palms and the soles. And lastly, I wanted to mention inverse psoriasis, which actually is fairly common. This is more is well demarcated, just like plaque. Um, they're erythematous lesions, but they have minimal scaling, and they're located in the intertriginous regions. And we'll have a photo of that. So I wanted to show erythrodermic psoriasis. You'll see this is very exploitative, um, the condition, and it can be full body as well. And this is a photo of inverse psoriasis. This is the, uh, the superior portion of the gluteal cleft. You'll see it's very well demarcated erythematous, and there really is not the scaling that you see with classic plaque psoriasis. And here as well, this is the inguinal region. Remember, inverse psoriasis will be in the intertriginous regions. And you may see a little bit of scaling, but nothing like plaque psoriasis. The next condition is confluent and reticulated papillomatosis, or bougereau carteau. Now, these are yellow-brown papules that can coalesce into larger patches. And just like the name suggests, you're more confluent in the center and more reticulated or net-like at the periphery. And it usually will start in the midline and then spread outward. So I wanted to just mention near the end here a couple bullous diseases or vesicular diseases because that can also mimic allergic contact dermatitis or vice versa. Bullous pemphigoid being autoimmune, it, it's categorized by intense pruritus and intense subepidermal bullae um, on an erythematous background. It can peak in the seventh, sixth to seventh decade of life and, and autoantibodies against the hemidesmosomal proteins at the basement membrane are responsible for this. Next is herpes simplex, another vesicular uh, type of condition caused by DNA viral infection, often affecting the mucocutaneous regions of the body, 
like really anywhere, and you have HSV1, HSV2 that can be responsible for this. Briefly, sarcoidosis, while commonly a pulmonary condition, a fourth of the patients will develop at least one dermatologic feature, um, whether that, that's patches or papules, plaques, nodules. Erythema nodosum is very classic for sarcoidosis. It actually confers a good prognosis, whereas lupus pernio being more of a chronic plaque-like induration over the face um, really can indicate more of a chronic multi-system disease. And these are just a few photographs of uh, nodules and plaques and different ways that sarcoidosis can present. And lastly, I wanted to mention mycosis fungoides. This is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, the most common cutaneous lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, just like allergic contact dermatitis, it is mediated by helper T-cells. And there are different stages of mycosis fungoides, from patches, plaques, and then tumor stage over the course of time. This is an important condition to always keep in the back of your mind because it often, it, it also, just like allergic contact dermatitis, has many different appearances. And once you have extracutaneous involvement, it's considered Cesare syndrome, which really confers a poor prognosis. Um, pathology, what's pathognomonic for mycosis fungoides are the patriae's microabscesses within the epidermis, which are clusters of cerebriform lymphocytes. So just to talk about, like I said, uh, on histology, it can really be important because while clinical judgment uh, shouldn't be overlooked and patch testing is a wonderful uh, tool as well, uh, a biopsy often can differentiate between acute allergic contact derm from vesicular bullous conditions that we talked about or persistent dermal contact derm differentiating it from rosacea or sarcoid or, or CTCL, and then, and then also differentiating uh, conditions that are associated with erythroderma, such as uh, Cesare syndrome or psoriasis. So are we not, the questions are not to be gone over in the presentation, or do we go over those? Okay, what's the best one to confirm contact derm? What do you think? B. 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 Pap shots, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Right. All of the following are true about allergic contact derm, except B. 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 Yes, that's correct. Okay. This is a long one. Thirty-five this mil. Since with a one-week history of veritic scaly erythematous skin packs on the upper chest, that happened before, occasionally dandruff. Parental includes all of the following except D. D as in dog? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Jacob, who really has uh, been my mentor, and then Dr. Eichenfield, um, the, the pediatric dermatology chief, um, as well. And then I just have my references. Sorry, I hope I didn't go too long there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harrow. That, that was absolutely fantastic. We really appreciate it. Obviously, we have a lot of studying to do as allergists. We're not as familiar with these lesions as you are, but they're very important, and we really appreciate your willingness to take us through this, uh, this uh, group of uh, skin disorders. Uh, we're going to have to stop at this point. We don't have time for questions because we have to move on to our next presentation. Just a reminder. Uh, we will be hearing part two in a couple of weeks, and uh, we will look forward to that. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.